Imagine, my brothers in Islam, the most expensive and the best blessing that you possess. Imagine your most cherished gift. How would you treat this blessing and this gift? Obviously, every one of us would treat such a gift with tenderness, with care, with love. Our Prophet Sallallahu said, There is nothing that a believer benefits from more after the taqwa of Allah than a righteous spouse, reported by Ibn Majah. How foolish then and harmful it is if a man amongst us abuses and harms that precious blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. And that it does not and cannot tolerate domestic violence and abuse against our spouses and families. And then there is something called emotional abuse, which is almost impossible to report and to quantify, much less qualify. But today we have this strange situation where people are bystanders and they know it happens. And mo mostly 90% females, 10% males, who are victims of domestic abuse and domestic violence. And many of us, unfortunately, we take this approach, which is that we expect someone else to deal with it, or we don't recognize this as something serious. We think somehow that the woman who is being beaten up, kicked in the teeth, having her you know, teeth smashed out, her ribs broken, we somehow think that she's to blame for this. One billion women in the world experience domestic violence and domestic abuse. They come from all backgrounds. They come from all classes, from rich, upper middle class and middle class families to you know the urban poor to working class families all colors all cultural backgrounds all social backgrounds brothers and sisters no matter what interpretation of sharia you follow you will never find a single scholar in the history of this ummah that has justified beating a woman because of some petty issue this is completely unjustifiable and that is why i say unequivocally spare me your false piety it is not from iman and taqwa that you are beating your wife this is who you are and then you want to justify it from the quran and sunnah we're not going to buy this from you the quran and sunnah does not allow this type of abuse O oh men O oh men Realize that these women that you are misusing and abusing, these women that you are transgressing on, they are the daughters to other men. They are sisters of other men. They are mothers of your own children. Would you want your own daughter to be treated the way that some of you treat your own wives? As you do unto others, it shall be done unto you. Brothers and sisters, the topic today is rarely mentioned amongst enlightened circles of Muslims because we find it embarrassing. It is a open secret that spousal abuse is rampant in our communities. I challenge that almost every one of us, almost every one of us is aware of some couple, some family that is going through spousal abuse. And yet it is a topic that is almost unheard of. And even in polite conversation in our gatherings, we simply do not bring it up. What is even more reprehensible, what is even more despicable, not just our tacit silence, but that some amongst us who are guilty of physical abuse, who are guilty of violence against their partners and their loved ones, some misguided people amongst us actually dare to justify that violence with the Quran and the Sunnah. They believe they have a religious sanction they believe they have permission from their Lord to harm their loved ones. And they always quote a phrase here and a hadith there. And they say, oh, I am implementing this ayah and this hadith. You have never opened a book of tafsir and you dare quote me an ayah. You don't know the basics of fiqh. How can you ignore what Aisha herself said in Sahih al-Bukhari when she said, I swear by Allah, the Prophet sallallahu never raised his hand against a woman or even a servant. You are not qualified to interpret the 
the Quran. So don't quote me half an ayah. Don't quote me a phrase of a hadith and ignore the rest of the seerah. This is not the way that a gentleman and a real mu'min treats a mu'mina. Treat your wives with the utmost kindness. The Prophet ﷺ is amazed, he's astonished. How can one of you beat your wives and then you will sleep with her at night? How can you do this? She is a woman that is the mother of your children. She is your life partner. This is our Prophet ﷺ, he's expressing amazement. How can you do this? She's a human being, even before being the sister of somebody and the, the daughter of somebody. She is a human, a woman that is your life partner. He himself is amazed because wallahi, this is not possible for a loving, caring person to treat another person in this manner and then have a bond of intimacy, a bond of, of, of relationship uh, between them. And subhanAllah, what is really sad, brothers and sisters, is that all too often, these people who abuse their wives, they are the essence of hypocrites who have two faces. Many times when it comes to the masjid and the community, MashaAllah, they are sweet as honey. MashaAllah, they are the most generous and the most kind. But their friends and their extended family and their immediate family knows all too well what happens behind closed doors. The people that should love him the most and respect him the most, fear him the most and despise him the most. And that is why when you have such blatant hypocrisy, that is why our Prophet ﷺ said, the best man amongst you is the one who is the best to his women and children. If your wife can respect you, then wallah, you are worthy of being respected. If your wife who knows your inner secrets and she knows exactly how you are, if she can vouch that this is an honest man, that is what you call a true gentleman. But when your wife and your children know you to be a fraud, then you are a fraud. Even if society puts you on a pedestal that is false. On the farewell khutbah of the Prophet wasallam, the most important khutbah of his life, addressed to the largest gathering of a hundred thousand people, on the plane that is the holiest plane, and on the day that is the holiest day, and he barely has five paragraphs, he dedicates an entire paragraph to women. And he tells the men, fear Allah when it comes to women. Fear Allah when it comes to women. Oh man, you will have to stand in front of Allah on Judgment Day. You think you have power over women? Allah has infinitely more power over you. And you will have to stand in front of Allah. And Allah will ask you how you dealt with your wife, how you dealt with your children. If you look at the statistics globally, you know, we're talking about one in three women across this world. That's one billion women who experience domestic violence. And when we're talking about domestic violence, we are talking about prolonged beatings, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, torture, breaking of bones. We're talking about serious levels of oppression and abuse that often happens under people's noses. People see it happening. In fact, you know, this is one of the big taboo issues across all communities, across the whole world, which people don't want to talk about. And because of that, unfortunately, we have many hidden victims and they suffer in silence. And just to give you an idea, women who experience domestic violence disproportionately have mental health problems. The children in those families also suffer from many, many dysfunctional problems and issues and behavioral problems. Unfortunately, some of those children on seeing this, observing this violence and learning this behavior from, you know, their father, who is supposed to be a role model for them, then go on to repeat this behavior. And I want to make it very clear that the sister called me up crying because there is their husband or a male relative on the other side of the door that wants to beat them black and blue. And a lot of people say, oh, turn a blind eye. This is a family issue. This is a domestic issue. I don't want to interfere. We will hear the screams and we will look away. And this is not the behavior of men. And this is not the behavior of a Muslim who stands up for justice always. And he's always shows solidarity with the victim who is oppressed against the oppressor. Take them by the hand, stop them from doing it. If you look at this, there's one, one verse in the Quran, it's the verse in which is in Surah At-Takwil. And that is the female child that was buried alive. For what crime was I killed? 
anyone who is oppressed and violated unjustly and unfairly, Allah ultimately will give them justice on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And the questioner who is the oppressor is asked, for what crime are you doing this? What is their injustice? What is the thing that they have done that is deserving of this? And the reality is, there is no excuse. There is no reason. So as I said, I went to this house where a man had beaten up his wife. She called me up crying down, her, get here, get here as soon as possible. I didn't get there before the ambulance had got there. And, uh, and by this time, obviously, the whole criminal justice system has kicked in now. And he had beaten up his wife to such severity that he had dislocated his shoulder. So can you imagine a man beating up a woman so fiercely that his shoulder was dislocated? And then when I came in there, because there's no justification, he looks at me and starts playing the victim. Oh, look what's happened to me. And while his wife is being treated in the ambulance. First he'll say, she made me do it. That she's somehow responsible. I've got nothing to do with this. This is not my fault. I was forced into doing this. I lost control. Next they'll say, I've got an anger problem. You know, I couldn't control myself. And she made me do it. As if to shift the blame. And we've been doing this for a long time. Shifting the blame always onto our sisters, always onto them. It's their fault. Well, what did she do that made you lose control? You know, was the dinner not ready on time? You know, did she just look back at you or something like this? Was it just that you were just having a lousy day, a terrible day, and you thought you'd come and bully someone and come home and take it out on them? You see, if Mike Tyson was in front of you and you had a lousy day, suddenly your thought process is clear. You don't beat up Mike Tyson. You might bite your ear off. But you'll do that with regards to that person you see as vulnerable. You do it in a way which is cowardly. You do it in a way which is hidden. And you can always shift the responsibility. And the other thing, as I said, it is your fault. Because somehow you think you are entitled to do this. Not through manners, not through conduct, not through intellect. And this is again one of the global catastrophes or problems that we have at the moment. That men today don't know what it means to be men. You know, the Prophet ﷺ is the embodiment of what it means to be ar-rijal, a man. He came as nothing other than a mercy to all the worlds. Mercy, justice, fairness, softness, kindness, generosity, protection, all of these things. You know, look at that hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, you know, he was looking at the Kaaba and he says, you know, no matter how beloved this is and how beautiful this is, he said that the blood of a Muslim is more precious, no matter how sacred the Kaaba is more sacred than the Kaaba itself. The protection of human beings is paramount and to make sure that they are free from any kind of violence, abuse, uh, oppression. A woman, a female is being repeatedly beaten and abused. It affects her religion. And that's why many of our sisters actually run away from religion. Forced marriage and things like this. They often end up seeing that this is Islam and they don't see Imams and people who are leaders within the Muslim community coming to their defense. So as a result of that, they run away from the religion. In the same way, we know that domestic violence, every day, imagine living in fear, making one mistake will result in a beating, being kicked in. Imagine the emotional and psychological distress that causes an individual and the mental health problems and the depression and the anxiety and the stress that that causes for women and for children. So therefore, it does not protect the sanity. Okay, it does not protect the mental state. I know many, many men who have, as a result of domestic violence, no longer see their children because they're barred, because of the child protection orders are on them. They're not allowed to see their children. And, then and, and many times children grow up, I've got no idea who my father is. Most importantly, the life and the sanity and the religion of women is affected as a result of domestic violence. It's very sad that we see where our sisters as a result of domestic violence often have to leave their home, have to leave everything behind, go into hostels. There are very few hostels around the country which are culturally sensitive, culturally appropriate, which provide a good environment for Muslim women. Rather, they go into homes where there are many other women, unfortunately, who have also experienced terrible domestic abuse, compounded with alcohol, drug problems, compounded with many other kind of social problems as well. Certainly not a healthy environment for our sisters to be in. All why? Because they're fleeing from violence and they find no one comes to their help and assistance. And we as a community, unfortunately, are not setting up the structures which are there to help and protect our communities. But also with regards to our sisters, they need lifelong counselling, 
They need support as well to deal with the emotional distress and issues that they've had. Often they stay within a abusive home and will go through up to 35 beatings before they actually go to the authorities. And they themselves will cover up the evidence of these beatings because it's such a difficult thing as women to come to accept that this man is beating me up in front of my children. And you'll find also the children will be harmed. Two women are killed every week by a partner or a former partner here in this country. That's one woman every three days, subhanAllah. Killed for what? What was her crime? One in four women experienced domestic violence in their lifetime. Domestic violence has a higher rate of repeat victimization than any other crime. These are all official statistics. Every minute the police in the UK receive a call regarding domestic violence. There was an estimated nearly 700,000 incidents of domestic violence in England and Wales. 81% of the victims are women, 19% were male. So yes, there is female on male domestic violence as well. The problem with regard to males who are being abused, sometimes not just necessarily by their wife, but other family members, it's not easy for men to say that I'm being beaten up, I'm being abused, I'm being harmed. You know, my wife comes up to me and she burns my arm, you know, or she'll cut me with a knife and things like that. It's not easy. And I want you to think about this. What kind of a society is it where women and children are not protected from violence and abuse? What kind of society is that? What does that say about that particular type of society? It says that society is completely a debased society, completely uncivilized. If those who are vulnerable, who need protection, cannot be protected in that society. The excellence of a society and a community is judged by how it protects those people who are the weakest in that society. And not the ones who are the most privileged, but the ones who are weakest and vulnerable. What we've actually got to do is show it in practice of standing up for our sisters not brushing it under the carpet, not turning a blind eye, not being intimidated by the elders. We respect them, but we don't respect them when they violate the rights of a human being and ultimately the haq of Allah. So, you know, this is not putting Islam into practice. And I want to tell you about a beautiful story of an amazing man who the Prophet ﷺ described as being an ummah all by himself on the day of judgment. Because he was a man who came before the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the advent of Islam. His name was Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl radiallahu anhu. And uh, he was upon the religion of Hanif. He was a monotheist amongst the Quraysh who were all polytheists. And he would go to the Kaaba and he would say, I am the only man here upon the religion of Ibrahim al-Islam, the religion of Abraham. The Arabs had this practice of female infanticide where they would bury their daughters alive. You know, in one narration of companion, he mentions that he did this. And it's one of the greatest regrets he had. And he would cry greatly. He dug her and put her in the sand. And she thinks a game is being played with her father. And then he covers her over with sands and hears her suffocate to death. But Zayd ibn Abu ibn Nufayl wasn't like that. In his, in, amongst the Quraysh at the time, where there was a daughter born, he would go to the family. How noble is this? And he would say, I will take your daughter. I will pay for her upkeep. I will bring her up. When she reaches adulthood, if you want her to return back to you, I will return her back to you. If not, I will continue to look after her. He would rescue children. And just that mere thought, we think what an amazing and noble behavior that he had. And when his son described his behavior to the Prophet wasallam, your father will come as a nation just by himself on the day of judgment. Forms of domestic violence, psychological, every day being criticized, be, being sworn at, being shouted at, being insecure, being told that you are worthless and rubbish, not sometimes just by the husband, by, by the in-laws as well, by other relatives. Many people even say the emotional mental health abuse is actually more serious than the physical abuse because as a result of the psychological abuse, then, you know, this results in loss of self-esteem, loss of confidence, depression, long-term mental health problems. No compassion, no mercy, no love, just uses her as an object. This is sexual abuse. This is not marriage. And we've got to call it for what it is. 
I, I actually spoke to him, that person. He was ashamed to speak to me. I said, is she a good wife? He said, yes, she's a good wife. So why do you abuse her in this? What is your possible justification? And he said, because it makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel like I'm the one who is in control by making her do things which are haram. Completely humiliating and degrading. Taking compromising photographs of your wife and then spreading them to other men. This is sexual abuse. This is sexual exploitation. And I've had cases where that an individual has even pimped his wife out. He's put her into prostitution to say, oh, you've got to do this. You've got to be in debt or this or that. People are coming to kill me. You have to do this. Then we have a very, very common type of abuse, which is the financial abuse. I'll give you an example. One of our sisters who was more or less in slavery, they wouldn't give her any money whatsoever. They wouldn't even give her money for her sanitary products. Other examples of financial abuse are the jewelry that she has, the gold that she has, any property that she has, any savings that she has, and then using them for yourselves. So really, domestic violence is all about power and control. A man who feels that he's emasculated, who's a very small man really, feels that he can become a big man by using violence. One of the reasons why men continue to be at women is because they generally are allowed to get away with it. So these are the three things which are first power, Second is the entitlement aspect of it. So what is the entitlement? That because I am the husband, then she should just do this. And third thing is impunity. Because men are allowed to get away with it, they will continue to do it. Because no one actually challenges and stops that behavior. Don't think of the sister as someone else's sister. She is your sister and she is your daughter and she is your relative. Whether she's Muslim or non-Muslim, doesn't matter. I would hate that my daughter is in a situation where she's being beaten up and she's being emotionally abused every day. So we don't wish this on anyone. How do we recognize the abusive person? One of the things that they often do is that they are people who ha have suffered from jealousy or hasad. As a result of that, they're suspicious of their partner, suspicious of their wife, and their unreasonable hasad or jealousy causes them to much more kind of controlling behavior. The other thing about the abusive person, they blame others. They don't take personal responsibility. They make every excuse under the sun. So what they'll do is that you'll punch someone in the face and you'll kick them and then after they'll say, oh, it's just a joke, when it wasn't play. They will try to deflect it. Oh, I'm not the one in wrong. Abusive to the children, using force during arguments and forceful and intimidating, using force in sex. So this is obviously not normal behavior. And what you'll find also with most abusers is that there is a whole history of abuse and violence. Overdominance, humiliation, isolation, threats, intimidation, denial and blame. So why do the sisters, unfortunately, why are they unable to leave? Okay, the first thing is they fear for their own safety. I can't leave. I'm so scared what he's going to do to me and my children. Or he'll make other people do this to me and my children. It becomes almost normal behavior for you. You're desensitized to it. You have lacked confidence. You lack so much self-esteem. You lack any worth. And, you, and as a result of that, you actually think, I deserve this. I actually deserve being beaten up. And that's a terrible state of emotional distress. And then the other thing is this, and we hear our sisters say this all the time. The husband will say, oh, you're not good for anything. You know, you'll never come to anything. If you leave me, no one will take you. And they continue to find that I will never find anyone else. You know, this is as good as it gets. Denial, which is that, did this really happen? Denying is sometimes easier than accepting that this has actually happened. And part of that denial, oh, it's not really that bad. Shame, of course, this is something which is so shameful and embarrassing for the sister. Guilt, because she blames herself for the action. Financial dependence. She knows if she goes anywhere else, where's she going to get the money? You see, it takes months sometimes to even get onto the welfare system. Many of our sisters are so isolated, they don't even know how to engage the welfare system after they've been kicked out of their home, how to even access support. Loyalty. She's loyal. And this is the amazing thing about women and the quality of women that even after all this abuse, they're still so loyalty to their husband. Fear of being alone. No one to turn to and no one to help. Even after all this abuse, brothers, you know, subhanAllah, sometimes the sister, she says, I still love him. She loves her husband. You know, when he goes and talks to everyone in the community, they all love him. And that's why they don't believe me. Because they all think he's such a great guy. And how can he be doing this stuff? Sisters say, they're so scared that he's going to charm you and then you're going to see me as the one who is the guilty party. And realize that, no, you have two faces. 
Here you're charming to me, but behind the doors you are a tyrant and you're an abuser. We believe that individuals can be reformed. But the first step is that you have to realize, I have a problem. This is not down to anyone else. This is all to do with me. And I will take personal responsibility. First advice to the victim. First and foremost, realize, O sister in Islam, or brother, if you are the one in abuse, that Allah Azza wa Jal is Al Qawi. And that the one who is strong in the eyes of Allah is the one who is weak in the eyes of men. The weaker and the more oppressed you are, the stronger you are in the eyes of Allah. The dua of the mazloom, of the one upon whom dhulm has been done, is the strongest dua. So do not feel weak. Wallahi, there is no one more powerful than the one upon whom dhulm has been done. And Allah will be on your side if dhulm has been done. So turn to Allah, establish a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Allah azza wa jal will answer your dua. And always spirituality and iman is a great refuge. It's something that will be positive to the soul. Number two, do not blame yourself. One of the most common symptoms of spousal abuse is you start blaming yourself. Maybe I deserve this. No. No, by Allah, no one deserves to be beaten. No one deserves to be whipped and, and hit in this manner. No one. Stop blaming yourself. No matter what faults a person might have, it does not justify this type of torture and this type of abuse. And this is one of the symptoms of those who are abused and re recognize this, that we need to overcome that symptom. Number three, if it is safe and you only know if it is safe or not, then confront your spouse directly. Explain to them that this is not something that you will tolerate. Remind them of Allah Azza wa and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if it is safe to do so. If it goes beyond this or if the situation is not safe, then you need to reach out to people whom you trust. Extended family, extended friends. You need to reach out for help and if the situation crosses the red line, if you are genuinely fearful of your life, of your physical safety, or the safety of your children, then wallahi, I tell you as a religious scholar, it is wajib to call some type of help, even if it is 911. Your life is more important than any supposed honor or supposed shame that you think you will bring to your family. Nothing is more sacred than your life when it comes to these type of scenarios. And understand as well, that if you have such a person in your life and it is constant abuse and there is no change, whether it's emotional, whether it is physical, constant abuse, then think about ending this marriage. Think about divorce. We have a stigma with divorce that is un-Islamic. Islam does not place the stigma on divorce that we do. Divorce is not the end of the world. If you're in a marriage in which your partner is always demeaning, always putting you down, then think about divorce after counseling. To be out of an abusive relationship and be free is better than to remain your life always being put down and demeaned, much less physically abused. Do not ever think that if I get divorced, who will take care of me? Your husband did not take care of you, Allah did. Your husband did not give you rizq, Ar-Razzaq did. So if your husband is that abusive and that demeaning and you feel that there's no hope and you have prayed istikhara, you've spoken to family and friends and you realize that this marriage is not good for you, then perhaps contemplate and think about walking away so that you can preserve your dignity because that is more important than being married to somebody who is constantly belittling and uh, humiliating you. And my advice to those who are committing the abuse, remember what Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, do not hold on to your wives only to cause them more harm. Because there are so many men, they get angry at their wives and they want to make the wives' lives a living hell. And Allah says in the Quran, if this is your niyyah, whoever does this, you aren't doing dhulm to your wife. You're doing dhulm to yourself. If the marriage is so bad and if it is so negative, then part way so that there's a breath of fresh air for both of you. And brothers and sisters, if we are going to turn a blind eye and we're going to ignore it, it is as if we are complicit in that abuse. May Allah Azza wa Jal save us from any such type of bull.